Hello, everybody. Welcome to Harmonic Analysis Seminar. It's our great pleasure to have uh, Jose Ramon Madrid Padilla from UCLA, who is going to talk about on classical inequalities for autocorrelations and autoconvolutions. Please, Jose, feel free to start. Uh, thank you, Pata, for the nice introduction and for the invitation. It's really a pleasure for me to have this opportunity. So, um, I'm going to discuss uh, some inequalities about autocorrelations and autoconvolutions. The motivation to study these inequalities comes from uh, uh, additive combinatorics, more precisely. Uh, or the motivation comes uh, from some problems about uh, Sidon sets. Uh, so let me start with this uh, definition. If we have uh, the natural number from one to capital N, uh, and A is a subset of uh, that set, so we say that A is a G Sidon set if uh, uh, the size of this set is at most G for every M. So a question that some people has been studying uh, in additive combinatorics is uh, how large uh, these uh, sets uh, can be, right? So, so how large a G Sidon set could possibly be? So um, it was observed uh, by Ciruelo, Rusa, and Minuesa in uh, 2010, that uh, this uh, problem in additive combinatorics is uh, closely related to uh, some other um, more analytic uh, question, which is about finding the optimal constant C, which is that this inequality holds for any uh, non-negative function F supported in minus one quarter, one quarter. Uh, so more precisely, uh, the relation between uh, this uh, beta and uh, this constant, the, the optimal constant C is given by this uh, identity. Uh, I am not going, uh, so, so in this talk, I'm going to focus on, um, on these kind of inequalities. Um, uh, we, we will discuss many inequalities related to this one. So I, I'm going to refer to this particular inequality as the supremum or the max uh, problem. Okay. So first of all, let me point out that it's very easy to obtain uh, an inequality like this uh, for, for a, with, a con with constant C equal to one, for instance. So, so uh, the most interesting uh, question is what is the optimal constant or uh, uh, something which is already not trivial is to, uh, to prove an inequality like this with a constant strictly larger than one. But with constant C equal to one, this is very easy. So let me explain why. If you use Fubini, uh, you can observe that these uh, identities uh, hold, right? So that is very simple. Um, uh, in particular, if f is a function supported in minus one quarter, one quarter, then the convolution, the autoconvolution is supported in minus one half, one half. So this identity holds. And uh, since this is an interval with length one, we have that the, uh, this average uh, is smaller than the supremo. Uh, I should point out, uh, so I, I, I mentioned in my abstract, and I should point out that this talk is going to, is, um, is good for a broad audience, in particular uh, for students. Uh, I am going to mention many open questions, and often the techniques we use to deal with these inequalities are uh, elementary. Uh, okay, so, so you can see that uh, from this uh, simple argument, uh, you can obtain this inequality with constant one instead of C, right? Okay, so uh, as I was saying, there, there were uh, many uh, progress uh, in, in that direction. So, so ideally, we would like to find the optimal constant. Uh, however, we don't know what is the optimal constant, but there, ha uh, there were many improvements of uh, the, la the lower bounds and the upper bounds for the optimal constant. So uh, uh, the first not trivial uh, lower bound was obtained by Ciruelo, Rus, and Trujillo. Uh, this is the bound they got in 2001. Uh, after that, there were many other improvements by Ben Green, uh, by Martin and O'Brien, Ju, uh, Matolci and Binuesa, and more recently by uh, Cloninger and Steiner Berger. Uh, this is the best uh, lower bound uh, known uh, so far. Uh, I should point out that, uh, okay, so, so we don't know what is the optimal constant, but you may wonder, uh, okay, so what is the best lower bound? What is the best upper bound that we can get? So, so on the other hand, uh, okay, I, I already mentioned a long list of uh, improvements in, 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 in um, regarding the lower bounds. So on the other hand, about the upper bounds, uh, it was believed for a long time that uh, pi over two was the optimal constant. And the reason uh, for that is because pi is of course very nice. Uh, 
And uh, if you consider this function S defined like this, then um, you obtain precisely that this has to be uh, an upper bound for the optimal constant. Um, obviously, uh, any function gives you an upper bound, right? So, so for any function f, uh, you obtain an upper bound on the optimal constant. So, so for a long time, it was believed that this was the best, uh, the best constant. Uh, however, that was disproved by uh, Matolshi and Binuesa in 2010. Uh, more precisely, uh, they proved that uh, this 1.51 is, uh, is an upper bound for the optimal constant. Um, the example that uh, they uh, found, that the example that uh, shows that this is an upper bound for the optimal constant uh, is the following. So as you can see, the example is not nice at all. <laughs> it's hard to identify some pattern. So th this tells you also a little bit about the difficulty of this uh, problem, right? So, um, so, uh, oh, I should point out that this is the picture of the autoconvolution of uh, the function uh, that gives uh, this uh, upper bound. In fact, it's a little bit less than 1.51. Uh, okay, so going back here, so we have a, uh, be aware that there is a gap. This is the best uh, no lower bound. This is the best no upper bound. So there is a gap. Um, here we have already some interesting open questions. Uh, can we, uh, of course, ideally we would like to find the optimal uh, constant, but uh, if, uh, if that is not possible, at least we would like to improve these bounds, right? In case you can find the optimal constant, there are some other interesting questions that you can ask. For instance, can we prove the existence of extremizers? That is something uh, unknown. That is another open question. Uh, and in case that you can prove the existence of extremizers uh, and, and that you know the optimal constant, of course, it will be interesting to try to describe the extremizers, right? Uh, so there are many things to be done or, or to be explored. And um, okay, so so I will uh, I am going to discuss some of the techniques that people have been using to deal with uh, these kind of questions. But before, I would like to go over some other related problems. Uh, if you have questions at some point, of course, feel free to ask. Uh, so so we have a supremum or max problem, uh, which is the one I was discussing a few seconds ago. But we may uh, also consider some variants. Um, for instance, this problem, uh, OK, OK. So for instance, uh, be aware that once again by Fubini, uh, it's easy to check that this inequality holds for any function in L1. Um, you may wonder, what is the best possible constant, right? Perhaps you can do better than 1 half. It was proved by Banner and Stenerberger that for any function in L1, this inequality holds. And moreover, uh, it's not possible to replace this constant by 0 0.37. In other words, the optimal constant has to be between these two values, right? Uh, so, so here we have also uh, many open problems, right? You can try to improve these bounds. You can try to uh, prove existence of extremizers. All those questions, they are open. Um, I should point out that uh, the optimal constant, so, so the, the upper bound uh, is given by this. Uh, and uh, since this looks uh, nice in principle, so one may think perhaps this is the optimal constant, but in fact, that is not the case. So we, we observe that, that the optimal uh, constant is strictly smaller than this. Uh, uh, one this. This is constant function, infimum over x, so it's a constant function. No, the infimum overall, uh, the x, uh, Oh, 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 okay, okay, yes, 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 yes. Uh, this, this is just a constant. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, yes, I, 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 I forgot to write. See, yes, this here is here we have a typo. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. It should not be infinite. Just two minus two sine x over x. Uh, no, but um, okay, no, no. This is one of no, no. This is right, but the infimum over x. Uh, let's see. No, 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 no. I think this is correct. Yes, this is one over two times minus two times the infimum over all the x in the set of the real numbers of this. Uh, in the case, yes, yes. I think I think that 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 that's the constant they got. Yes, if I remember correctly. Yes. Ah, okay. It's not optimized. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. This this is a particular constant and is given with, uh, precisely. So so yes, this is the infimum over all the x uh, in the set of the real numbers of this question. Yes. So okay. this is this gives you precisely zero point four one one something like that. Yes. Yes, sorry. I will come back to this later also because uh, the idea to obtain this uh, bound is, uh, I can explain that in a few lines and it's very interesting. Uh, so, so, 
Uh, we will come back to this later. Uh, but anyway, so, okay, so we have a supremum problem. We have a, an infimum or mean problem, which is this one. Uh, you, may, well, you may wonder, perhaps there is something between. Um, and uh, yes, right, it's natural to expect, uh, it's natural to consider some average problem, right? Something between. <laughs> so um, this is the next uh, question I would like to discuss. Um, so if we have a function, uh, if we consider um, the intersection of L1 and L2, uh, so first of all, uh, be aware that uh, by Fubini, we have that this inequality holds, right? Uh, for any function here in this intersection. And also, if you use uh, cauchy or, or Holder inequality, you can observe that this inequality is also true, right? This is very simple. Uh, here is important that this is an interval with length one, right? Of course. Uh, then we can multiply these two inequalities to obtain this, right? And once again, you may wonder, you may ask, uh, is the, uh, can we do better than one? Can we obtain uh, some better uh, bound? Um, so, so let me say a few words about that. Um, uh, that that's a problem that I have been studying uh, in the last uh, couple of years uh, with Joao Pedro Ramos and with Jama de Dios. Uh, so let me say a few words. Let me focus on this last problem, the average problem, and let me say uh, what we know so far. So. Uh, first of all, um, a few years ago, Banner and Stenberger, they proved that for any uh, function uh, in L1 and also in L2, so in this intersection, uh, this inequality holds, uh, and uh, this constant cannot be replaced by 0 0.a. So, so the optimal constant has to be between these two values. Uh, as I pointed out before, uh, it's trivial to obtain this bound with constant one, but, but uh, it's not trivial to obtain this with a constant strictly smaller than one. Uh, Okay, so, so the, 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 I should point out that the lower bound uh, comes uh, from uh, this particular example, right? So, so any example gives you a lower bound. Uh, this is the example that they uh, found that gives this uh, particular lower bound. Uh, be aware that this, uh, ex, uh, this function uh, in this example that they consider uh, has not uh, compact support. Uh, this, I will come back to this uh, observation later. Uh, but anyway, so, so first of all, we wanted to, so we were interested in this question. So we, we wanted to obtain some uh, better bounds, some improvements at least. Uh, of course, ideally, uh, once again, we would like to obtain the optimal constant, but otherwise, uh, at least some improvements, right? So uh, this is a, a better bound that we got. So instead of 0 0.91, you can obtain this uh, bound, uh, 0 0.86. Uh, in fact, more recently, we got uh, a more uh, a very precise uh, approximation of what uh, the optimal constant should be. Uh, but I will come back to that in a few minutes. But uh, okay, let me explain how to obtain this inequality. Uh, the the uh, as I was saying, the, the techniques to deal with these kind of inequalities are often elementary, so so um, they are accessible for a broad uh, uh, audience. Uh, so, so this is this, this is an sketch of the proof. Uh, remember that what we want to do is we want to bound this. So let me start with that. So if you use uh, basic Fourier analysis, if you use Plancherel, you you observe that this identity holds. And then, uh, of of course, the, this this uh, quotient comes from the Fourier transfer of the characteristic function of minus one half one half, right? But anyway, so if you use Holder inequality, you obtain this. Uh, for every p larger than one, right? We can do this, and then uh, be aware that uh, so so the, what is the holder conjugate of two times p prime? So p prime is p over p minus one. The holder the holder conjugate of two times p prime is precisely two times p over p plus one, which is something between one and two. Um, so 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 we can use house or down inequality to opt uh, the optimal house or down inequality to obtain a nice bound for this term. Uh, so, so we, we, we have seen that uh, this term is bounded by this. Here we are using um, the optimal version of the house of inequality that was obtained by Wegener, right? So this is a well-known result. Uh, and, and moreover, since we have that this quotient uh, lies between one and two, uh, we can use interpolation, right? To, to uh, obtain that uh, this uh, is bounded by this product, right? 
And then uh, you can combine this bound with uh, the trivial bounds that we discussed before. Uh, and then you can optimize uh, on P and you obtain, uh, that if you optimize on P, you obtain this upper bound. So it's just that. Um, in fact, the, when you consider the particular case P equal to, you already get an improvement uh, over the bound that was uh, previously obtained by Banneres and Stenerberger. More precisely, you get like 0 0.87. Um, uh, but anyway, so, so it's natural to consider also some other variants. Uh, for instance, instead of the interval, um, instead of the characteristic function of the interval minus one half, one half, you can consider some other probability measure, let's say, right? So for instance, on Gaussian means. So if you go, here we have this autocorrelation um, and uh, we can consider uh, um, this, uh, we can multiply uh, by this Gaussian and we can divide by uh, the integral of that Gaussian. Right? You may wonder, uh, you may ask similar questions. So, so what is the best uh, constant? So is that an inequality relating this autocorrelation and this product uh, holds, right? Uh, for instance, just to illustrate uh, what happened in this uh, case of Gaussian means, if A is equal to two times P, uh, then uh, this is the upper bound that we get, and this is the lower bound. So, 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 the, so the, the gap is even smaller uh, than the one that we had before, right? Remember that here the gap uh, is a little bit larger, right? So there is more room to, to get improvements. Okay, so, um, so th these were the uh, previous bounds uh, until recently, uh, the, the best bounds. Um, uh, the, these are the bounds in the case of uh, the characteristic function minus one of uh, the uh, close interval minus one half, one half. And these are uh, some bounds that we got in the case of uh, these uh, Gaussian means, more precisely for this particular Gaussian, right? Uh, so, so recently, um, with Jaume de Dios, we were able to obtain some uh, very precise uh, approximation of the optimal constant in, in the case of this uh, uh, characteristic function, uh, the, 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 the standard situation. So these are the bounds that we get. And in the case of Gaussian means, uh, these are the bounds that we get. So let me explain uh, what we did. Uh, and then I am going to discuss many uh, open problems related to this, uh, a part of those open problems that I already mentioned. Um, if you have more questions at some point, of course, feel free to ask. But before moving on, uh, of course, instead of Gaussian means, we can consider a more general way, right? So, so there is no reason just to uh, focus on those particular situations. So we can consider, for instance, uh, a way like this, a function which is in L1 and also in L infinity, um, uh, and uh, symmetric and decreasing. Um, um, in, in particular, this, this family uh, of weights includes uh, the, this uh, characteristic function, which is the standard situation, and also the case of Gaussian means, right? So, so this is uh, some uh, larger family uh, of weights or functions that we can consider. For each of those weights, we can ask a similar question. Uh, what is the, uh, of course, the, the, the main uh, objective will be to find the optimal constant, such that this inequality holds for any function in this intersection. Uh, but at least, uh, in case we're unable to find the optimal constant, at least to obtain some nice bounds, right? Moreover, um, it will be interesting to, to try to establish the existence of extremizers. So let me start from there. Let me... Uh, so, so we were able to establish the existence of extremizers. Let, let me focus uh, on the usual situation. So in the case when we are dealing, uh, uh, okay, so let me explain. So uh, let me start talking about the, uh, how to prove the existence of extremizers for an inequality like uh, the one that I just showed you a few seconds ago. Uh, what we did was, first of all, we established the existence of extremizers uh, under some additional restriction. But then from that, we were able to obtain the existence of extremizers in the general situation. So uh, originally, uh, we considered this class LGI, uh, which is uh, defined in this way. So basically, for any function in L1, which is not negative, if you have that i is a compact, uh, let's say an interval, uh, you can denote that LGI, the class of non-negative um, L1 functions, so that uh, outside of i, we have this nice control, right? So, so they, these functions are bounded by g. Uh, as an example to keep in mind, you can consider, for instance, uh, G to be the characteristic function of an interval uh, minus R, R, right? So, 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 so then basically uh, F will be zero outside of uh, 
that interval, right? So, so we are considering functions with compact support. Uh, so whenever we, when we restrict ourselves, when we consider um, uh, the, the, the inequality that we were studying, but uh, we restrict our, ourselves to, to the particular, uh, to this particular situation, so to functions in, in not only in this intersection, but also in this class, uh, then we are able to establish uh, the existence of examisers. That was the first um, step. That was the first result we got. Um, and um, in particular, as I was saying, so, so you can uh, choose G to be the characteristic function of an interval minus RR with R very large. Uh, and then uh, we can prove that there exists a function uh, such that, uh, so th that is an extremizer uh, when we are working in this class of functions, okay? Um, so, so to observe that, uh, we, we follow an, uh, more or less a standard approach. So, so you can consider a sequence, uh, an, extremizer, uh, an extremizing sequence of functions. Uh, uh, there are some technicalities, but at least uh, let me say just a few words. Uh, of course, you can uh, be a rescaling or uh, a normalization. You can upset, you can uh, assume without loss of generality that this product is equal to one. Uh, then uh, since this product is equal to one uh, by interpolation, you have this inequality. And then by house or we have this inequality. And this can be, uh, we can rewrite this uh, in this way. And then we can use uh, Banas and Laolu, right? U using the fact that LP is reflexive for every P larger than one. So, so we, we have, uh, we can find some functions, capital M, G, and H, such that all these convergence hold. Uh, uh, and then uh, pro proving that uh, G is the Fourier transfer of uh, capital M is not so difficult, but proving that H has to be G squared uh, requires more work. Uh, and in fact, to prove that H has to be equal to G squared uh, is, uh, th that is precisely the part where we uh, use this uh, additional uh, condition, right? That when we need uh, some control, some extra control, and that's the reason why in principle, we, we restrict ourselves to this particular class of functions. Um, okay. So, what about the general situation, right? So, so, so if we restrict ourselves to functions with compact support in an interval uh, minus RR, uh, then we can, we, can establish, uh, we can establish the existence of extremizers. But if we, uh, if we don't have some additional uh, restriction like that, uh, what can we say? So, um, so in, to deal with the general situation, a key ingredient is, is to use the Euler-Lagrange uh, equations. Uh, the Euler Lagrange uh, equations corresponding to uh, the inequality that we are studying uh, are given by uh, this. Uh, and, and basically, uh, first of all, be aware that the inequalities that we are studying, uh, so, so because of the uh, quotient that we are studying, uh, it makes sense to consider this uh, functional, right? Because uh, basically, what we have here in the right hand side is log of uh, this uh, integral uh, divided by uh, the product of the L1 naught of G and the L2 naught of G, right? So, so, so if you want to maximize uh, uh, that, uh, if you want to maximize that portion, uh, then uh, so, so it makes sense to consider this functional and then uh, the, the corresponding Euler-Lagrange equations will be uh, this one, right? Given by this identity. Uh, okay, so, so this is very important uh, because uh, what we have is that uh, what, what the, the idea is going to be that, okay, so we know that for a fixed interval minus RR, uh, we can, um, if we restrict to functions that are uh, supported in that interval, then we can establish the existence of extremizers. And we want to prove that if R is sufficiently large, that extremizer is also an extremizer for the general problem with, without any additional uh, restriction. Uh, and basically what we do is, uh, so, so uh, from this identity, uh, if we take integrals uh, in both sides, uh, so first of all, let, let's, let's, okay, so we know that uh, the extremizer F bar is supported in this interval minus RR. So, so let's assume that uh, we can imagine that the precise support of F bar is uh, minus AA. And then we can, we can integrate in, in the precise support of F bar, right? So, so if this function is uh, supported here, if we take integrals from minus A to A, uh, uh, 
using this identity, what we obtain is uh, this other identity, okay? Uh, and this, this uh, I, 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 no, I don't want to get too much into technicalities, but this identity allows you to get an upper bound on A. Uh, more precisely, uh, from this identity, uh, if you re rearrange uh, the, these terms around, uh, you obtain that A has to be bounded by this. Uh, and moreover, since we have that uh, F bar is supported in minus AA by holder inequality, this inequality holds. Uh, and then uh, instead of this quotient, we can replace uh, this quotient by uh, a square root of two times A. Uh, and uh, from that, uh, we obtain this inequality. So, so the whole point is that we obtain an upper bound on uh, the support of F bar. In principle, this upper bound uh, depends on capital R, but uh, we can also prove that uh, the optimal constant for the general problem uh, is the limit of the optimal constant for the problems uh, that we are uh, discussing now. So when you have this additional condition that we are considering function supported in minus RR. So, so, so using this uh, property, the fact that uh, this limit is equal to the optimal constant for the original problem, uh, we can obtain a uniform bound uh, on A. Uh, so, 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 so that, that basically tells you that if R is sufficiently large, the uh, extremizer for the problem uh, that we, with the additional condition that the functions are supported in minus RR is, is also an extremizer for uh, the, the main problem that we are considering without any additional uh, condition. So, so that's basically the idea. But of course, there are some technicalities uh, involved. Um, Okay, so, so that's a way to, to prove the existence of extremizer for uh, these uh, kind of uh, inequalities. But this argument, uh, we were able to, to do that, to, to establish the existence of extremizers only in the case of the average problem, uh, not in the case of the max or the mean problem. Uh, in fact, we were able also able to, to observe that the extremizers, they have to be nice. Uh, for instance, uh, you can prove that uh, the extremizer uh, has to be bounded. Uh, the extremizer, uh, because of risk rearrangement inequality, we can also observe that the extremizer has to be uh, symmetrically decreasing. Uh, and uh, moreover, we have boundedness also at the derivative level. So, so the extremizer has to be very smooth, very nice. Um, uh, and uh, as I, something that we get also from here, so as I was saying, so, so if R is very large, the extremizer uh, that, we ha that we get when we consider functions in L1, L2 with uh, support in minus RR is also an extremizer for the general problem. So this also tells you that uh, the extremizer, so, so we have extremizers uh, with compact support, right? This also tells you that we have extremizers with compact support. So let me show you a picture of uh, how the extremizer looks like. So, so here is a nice picture. Um, uh, the red one uh, corresponds to uh, the case when the way that we are considering is the characteristic function of minus one half, one half, which is the, the, the use of the standard situation, the original situation that we were studying. Uh, and the black one corresponds to the case of Gaussian means. So, so you can see that uh, these uh, extremizers, they are uh, symmetrically decreasing, um, they are smooth, and they are compactly supported. So, so, so if you remember when, 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 I, when I mentioned the lower bound that was originally uh, observed by Banner uh, and Stenerberger, uh, the example that they considered uh, was not, has not compact support. So, so, uh, so it, it was very surprised for us in principle to observe that in fact, we have extremizers uh, with compact support. Uh, so, so the extremizers for the, for the average problem are very nice. Uh, so, so you may wonder, perhaps we also have nice extremizers for the max or the mean problem. Uh, however, remember the picture I showed you a, a while ago about uh, the best uh, upper bound uh, no for the max problem. So the picture was horrible. So, so, so in fact, there is no clue. So we have no idea about how the extremizer looks like in the case of the max problem. So, so the max problem seems to be really more complicated. Um, uh, but anyway, so I will come back to, to the, uh, I will say a few more words about the mean problem also later. Um, but anyway, so, so let, let me say a few words about uh, the argument that uh, allow us to obtain uh, this approximation for the, uh, th this very nice, uh, very uh, precise approximation for the optimal uh, constants. Uh, so, so, so first of all, we consider some auxiliary spaces. 
Uh, in principle, you may think that these are a little bit weird, but uh, the, the, the idea, so, 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 so these, are, these, these spaces are not, these uh, objects are not that weird. In particular, if we consider the set of all the functions in, in this intersection, in L1 and L2, uh, she's that this is bounded. Uh, you can observe that uh, that is a Hilbert space. So that, that gives place to a Hilbert space. Uh, and, and we use this as an auxiliary uh, space, uh, as I am going to explain in a few seconds. The idea is that dealing with the original problem uh, in principle is kind of complicated, but uh, it was more convenient for us to consider uh, a, a different representation of uh, the original problem. Using, uh, using the fact that by arithmetic mean, geometric mean inequality, we have that this minimum is equal to two times A times B. So, so this is very simple, right? It's just arithmetic mean, geometric mean. Uh, and this identity allow us to, uh, to, re to re uh, re uh, replace uh, the denominator. Remember, in principle, we have the product of the L1 norm and the L2 norm. But instead of that, we can write this uh, because of this identity. So, so and then we can just uh, uh, abbreviate this. Uh, we can use uh, this notation. Uh, uh, so, so basically, this is the optimization problem we want to solve. So uh, in the last step, the only thing we are doing is we are normalizing, right? So I can assume that the H lambda norm of F is equal to one, right? So I can restrict to that particular uh, situation. Uh, okay, so, 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 so what is the idea? So we use those spaces to move from the continuous problem to a semi-discretized uh, problem. And then from the semi-discretized problem, we move to a discretized problem. And then uh, there uh, we observe some nice properties about uh, this uh, optimal constant and, and that allows you to use numerical analysis. Uh, so, so what do we mean by semi-discretized? We mean functions like this, that are constant on intervals of this form. So, so, so we can consider the analogous problem for uh, semi-discretized functions. So, so, so C lambda delta will be the supremum uh, of uh, that portion uh, under these conditions, right? So, so, so the, the, the optimal constant for, for the semi-discretized problem uh, is, um, is close to the optimal constant for the continuous problem. More precisely, they are related by this. So, so, so basically to study this, uh, the continuous problem, we can focus our attention on the semi-discretized problem, right? That is the meaning of this inequality. Uh, the, the, this uh, observation is, uh, not trivial, it requires, of course, an explanation. Uh, for, in order to do that, for any function f, uh, for any continuous function f, we, we define some semi-discretized version of f in a natural way, right? So considering uh, average, uh, defining uh, this to be constant in uh, equal to the average in each of these intervals. Uh, and then uh, we observe some nice uh, properties of this uh, uh, objects, some orthogonality, we, you need to use some uh, Poincare inequality and some other uh, usual analytic inequalities. But anyway, the whole point is that uh, these two constants, they are uh, close to each other, right? So, so we can move one step down. We can move, we can focus our attention on the semi-discretized problem. In fact, we can also, uh, then we observe that the, the semi-discretized problem is related, uh, is, uh, can be reduced to the discretized, uh, to the discrete problem, right? Uh, basically, if we have a function f uh, from uh, this discrete set to R, uh, and, and we consider EF to be this uh, function, so be aware that EF will be a semi discrete uh, uh, function, right? So it will be a function which is constant in uh, these intervals. So, so, so these two functions are closely related, in particular, these identity calls. And basically, this is the key that allows you to reduce the continuous problem to the discrete problem. Uh, and then uh, once we are uh, there, uh, we, we, uh, we use numerical analysis. Uh, basically, the key observation is the following. Remember that we had this representation, right? Uh, remember that uh, originally we have below in the denominator, we have the product of the L1 norm and the L2 norm, but, but then we use these auxiliary spaces, H lambda, uh, and uh, we, we obtain that the optimal constant for the original problem is equal to this, uh, uh, to this optimization uh, problem, right? It's equal to what we have here in the right-hand side. So, uh, 
So, so the key observation is the following. So the denominator uh, is nice, can be uh, rewritten. Uh, we can rewrite the denominator in this way, uh, where this uh, uh, object, A lambda, is a Hermitian positive defined matrix. Uh, and then basically, uh, if we use this information, uh, we can rewrite this quotient uh, in this way. Uh, and this means basically that you reduce the problem uh, to find uh, the largest uh, agent value for M lambda. Uh, so, 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 so the, the maximum of the spectrum of M lambda, uh, which is a well-known problem. People have been studying this, uh, this kind of problems uh, for a long time. Uh, and and this, uh, at this moment, we can use uh, numerical analysis efficiently. Uh, I should point out that uh, originally, uh, we had some, uh, a different, we try a different approach, which is the following. So uh, by the Euler-Lagrange equations corresponding to this uh, uh, problem, uh, we have that the extremizer should satisfy this identity. Uh, uh, so, so, so this suggests uh, a different method, a fixed point method. So, so for any function f, you can define tf to be the right hand side. And then you would like to, to consider for, you can start with any function f and you can consider the orbit of f, tf, t, t2f, and so on. Uh, and you, and you, you can imagine perhaps that converts to a fixed point, right, as usual. Uh, it turns out that that seems to be the case. At least we have numerical evidence that suggests that this should be true. Uh, however, we were unable to justify that uh, formally. So, so, so uh, the method seems to work. Uh, uh, and in fact, it seems to work faster than uh, in the way that I uh, described uh, previously about using the, the, the fact that the optimal constant is the largest agent value of some nice matrix. Uh, but we were unable to justify that this method works formally. So that's, that's another interesting thing uh, to be explored. Um, as I was saying, so you, 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 you may think perhaps since we have this nice result for the average problem, perhaps you can say something similar also for the, for the max or the mean problem. Uh, for instance, if we compare uh, to the specific, uh, if we compare specifically the average and the max problem, unfortunately, the max problem seems to be uh, more complicated. In particular, as I was saying, uh, there is no reason to expect that the extremizer for the max problem is going to be uh, smooth or nice, right? Uh, or compactly supported or something like that. We have really no information. Uh, it's hard to guess how the extremizer looks like. Uh, there are some other uh, technicalities. Uh, for instance, uh, it, um, it, it, we cannot uh, hope uh, that a fixed point method is going to be uh, uh, helpful in the case of the max problem as well because of some other uh, difficulties that appear uh, that we have observed. Uh, Okay, so let me say a few words about some other uh, related open problems and then I will conclude. Uh, so first of all, for each of these problems, of course, the main goal is to find the optimal constant. Uh, otherwise, at least to improve the, 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 the bounds that are known so far. Uh, but for instance, okay, we prove the existence of extremizers for the average problem. We, uh, in the case of the max and the mean problem, I should point out that we don't know uh, whether or not the extremizer exists. But in the case of the average problem, we know that the extremizer exists, but uh, we don't have a precise formula. Or, or we don't know exactly what is uh, the extremizer. We know how uh, it looks like, but we don't know what is precisely uh, the, the extremizer. Uh, Another related problem is, uh, it was suggested by Martin and O'Brien. Uh, these, these two authors, they have been working in this kind of uh, convolution and uh, autocorrelation inequalities. And, and what they suggested is the following. Um, you can prove that for any function in L1 and also, which is in L1 and also in L2, then this inequality holds with, uh, if you replace this by, by, by one. So, so that is trivial, right? It's just holder also, once again. It's, uh, but there is a uh, conjecture that you, you should be able to obtain something better than one. Uh, and that is uh, still an open problem. Uh, I should uh, point out that it was observed by Matochi and Binuesa that in case you are able to obtain something better than one, uh, it's going to be a very small improvement, right? So, so, so C has to be at most this. And I should point out also that the non-negativity condition is very important because if you remove this, uh, we can observe that uh, one is the best you can get. So, so, so there is not really an improvement. 
Uh, another related problem is the mean uh, minimum overlapping problem. Uh, th this was uh, this problem was suggested by Erdos, and the idea is that you have the natural numbers from one to two times n. Uh, you split this uh, set of natural numbers in two in two sets, capital A and capital B, each of them with n uh, elements. Uh, and then you define mk to be the number of solutions for uh, this for this identity for this equation. Mk is the number of solution for this equation. Uh, and uh, then you define so, so so of course since uh, since each of these uh, natural numbers that we are considering uh, belong to this uh, set from one to two times n, we have that uh, k has to be uh, uh, between these two values, right? Minus two times n and two times n. So then you can define mn in this way. Uh, and the idea is to estimate um, uh, mn in terms of n, right? So, so uh, more precisely, you would like to analyze this limit. Uh, it was proved by uh, Howland that uh, these uh, inequalities hold. And in fact, uh, I, the reason why I mentioned this uh, problem is because the, the way he uh, approached this uh, question was precisely, you can, uh, so as we did at the beginning of this talk, so we started talking about Sidon sets and then we observed that that problem was closely related to some analytic inequality about uh, autoconvolution uh, uh, in, in autocorrelation inequalities. So what he did was so also very similar. You can observe that uh, solving this uh, problem, uh, you, you can observe that this, uh, so, so basically what he did was to, to consider some, uh, to follow a similar approach, to consider some autocorrelation, autoconvolution inequalities, uh, and also uh, some discretization argument. He used some numerical analysis and he got this. So, uh, so, so, so this problem is closely related to those that I was uh, discussing before. Uh, more recently, also, uh, uh, there is a paper by uh, Carlin, uh, Jocelyn, uh, Lieb, and Loss, uh, where they consider this inequality. Uh, so here we, here we have an autoconvolution. Uh, and uh, they observe that for any function that satisfies this inequality, you need to have some nice properties. Uh, for instance, uh, the integral has to be at most one half. Uh, uh, F has to be non-negative. Uh, and depending on the size of the integral, uh, depending on the size of the integral, uh, they, they got also some information about f, about the decay of f. Uh, so, so, so this is also a very nice uh, 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 short paper. Uh, and uh, going back to the mean problem, so I, to conclude, I just wanted to say a few a few more words about the mean problem. Um, so, so in the case of the mean problem, we we are considering the autocorrelation in and uh, we want to compare the, 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 the minimum of this uh, autocorrelation to uh, the, the L1 norm of F, right? To the square of the L1 norm of F. So if we are fixing, it, so, so uh, by scaling, we can assume without loss of generality that the minimum is one half. So what you would like to do is you would like to, if you want to maximize the quotient of the minimum and the square of the L1 norm, so you want to minimize uh, the, the L1 norm of F. So to do that, uh, we can we, you can do the following. Uh, first of all, if you define GT to be equal to this, so of course GT is at least one half in this interval because we're assuming that this minimum is equal to one half. And then uh, the integral of G is the square of the L1 naught of F by Fubini. Uh, and since GT is at least one half in this interval, in this interval, we can write GT as, the, uh, as this addition. So the characteristic function of minus one, one times one half plus a non-negative function H. And then uh, remember, so what you would like to do is to obtain a nice lower bound on the L1 nor of F, but to obtain a nice lower bound on the L1 nor of F will be enough to obtain a nice lower bound on the L1 nor of G, and, and then it will be enough to obtain a nice lower bound on the L1 norm of H. Uh, and to do that, what you, so, so once again, you use uh, basic Fourier analysis. Uh, so, so you observe that, uh, that, uh, that this inequality holds, uh, and this gives you uh, a lower bound on the integral of H. So, so you, and, and, and as I was saying, a lower bound on the integral of H uh, gives you a lower bound on the integral of F, right? Uh, and then in, in, uh, from that, you obtain uh, this upper bound. So, so it's a very short argument, uh, and, uh, and this is the best upper bound now so far for the mean problem. So, so there is some, 
there is some room, uh, so there is still a gap, so we, we, uh, we can try to, to at least, of course, the, the main goal will be to obtain the optimal constants, but at least we can try to improve these bounds. Uh, let me just point out that the lower bound that they got in the mean problem uh, is 0 0.37, and that comes from this uh, example. The motivation to consider this example is the following. Uh, so the philosophy behind this is that if you have uh, a function which is too flat like this, uh, then the product, uh, so, so the autocorrelation is going to be very small. Remember that you want to maximize the, uh, the, the minimum of the autocorrelation over the square of the L1 or of F. So, so this is not good. But then if the function is too concentrated like this, you may have also a very tiny intersection, right? So, so, so if the functions are concentrated, then uh, the overlap can be very small. And that is also not good because you want to maximize that, that quotient. So, so this example uh, looks like this. So, and, uh, in, in, and this example is the one that gives this uh, lower bound 0 0.37, which is kind of close to the upper bound, right? 0 0.41, but there is still some gap. So, so I just wanted to conclude with this, uh, but, but uh, I wanted to make emphasis on the fact that there are many open uh, problems and there are many uh, interesting related questions um, in uh, anyway. So that's all what I wanted to say. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jose. This was a great talk. Very nice, nice presentation. I guess I will stop recording and then we can proceed with asking questions.